Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual Better Hearing webinar. Today, we're talking about hearing loss prevention and auditory training. My name is Caitlin Whitson. I'm a doctor of audiology at UNC Chapel Hill's Hearing and Communication Center. I'm joined by Anne Marie Egan, who is our fourth year doctoral extern, and she will soon be leaving us to graduate. And in a, about a week and a half, she will also be a doctor of audiology. A little bit of background about our clinic for those that have never been here before. Uh, we are a nonprofit faculty practice of doctors of audiology. We were founded as a training clinic for the doctoral students going through the audiology program at UNC Chapel Hill. We work with every hearing aid model and manufacturer, and we run on an unbundled or fee-for-service business model. In addition to hearing aid services, we also offer balance and tinnitus specialty testing. And we've recently opened a satellite clinic at the Orange County Sportsplex in Hillsboro, North Carolina. And the picture at the bottom right is a picture of our main clinic off of Farrington Road behind the Shell gas station on Highway 54. We are growing our YouTube channel and here is a, a link for how to access it. And please subscribe if you haven't already. We'll post new Better Hearing webinars every month as well as some other videos related to our clinic. So May is Better Hearing and Speech Month and what better topic to talk about when we think about better hearing than auditory training and hearing loss prevention. Today, we'll start with a discussion on how to prevent hearing loss and the, of course, the, the top preventable form of hearing loss, the most preventable form of hearing loss is that caused by noise. We'll also spend some time talking about age-related hearing loss and how antioxidants may be preventative. And Marie will then go on to talk about different forms of auditory training and have a discussion on lip reading and communication strategies. Before we start, I want to do, show everyone a video of what hearing loss sounds like to give everyone an, an idea of what people with varying severities of hearing loss experience on a day-to-day -day basis without hearing aids. I know I'm young, could be a little bit wiser, but I've had my fair share of love. in your life If we all take one step That's a giant thing for one little girl I know I'm young Could So as I mentioned already The most preventable form of hearing loss is that caused by noise. So I want to spend some time talking about how to prevent damage from occurring from loud noise. There is a huge risk of noise exposure right now and noise-induced hearing loss happening for young adults all across the world. And worldwide, 1.1 billion young people are at risk of hearing loss due to unsafe listening practices. Worldwide, over 43 million people from the ages of 12 to 35 live with a disabling hearing loss already. And among young people in that same age bracket in middle and high income countries, nearly 50% are listening to unsafe levels of sound through personal audio devices. And about 40% are exposed to potentially damaging levels of sound at loud places like nightclubs, bars, and sporting events. Noise-induced hearing loss is also the most common military occupational disability. So it's, it's a big problem and a growing problem. How do you know when sound is too loud 
When is my hearing at risk of being damaged? Well, if you're at an event and you have to speak up for the person next to you to hear you, it's probably too loud. If you have to keep moving closer and closer together to be heard where you're very close, it's probably too loud and could be damaging your hearing. And then of course, later after you leave a loud event, if speech around you is sounding muffled, if you've got ringing in your ears, you have probably done some damage to your ears and that's damage that is not always reversible. To give you an idea of how loud sounds can be, we've shown this chart here and volume and loudness is measured on a decibel scale. And this scale goes from about zero being very, very soft up to 140 plus being painfully loud. And average conversational speech falls somewhere around the 60 decibel range. Something as soft like whispers or leaves rustling, maybe around 20 to 30 decibels. And then other very loud sounds like a hairdryer or helicopter flying by around the 100 decibel range. How do you know how loud the volume is of the place you're at? How do you know what it is in decibels? Well, an audiologist would use a sound level meter to take noise measurements around, but not everyone has a sound level meter that they can use. There are really nice smartphone apps out there. And if you type sound level meter into your Play Store or App Store, you will get a lot. Um, NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, has created a really good and, and pretty accurate app that we recommend to our graduate students. And we talk about a lot with people. Uh, when you open it up, it'll automatically start taking a sound measurement. And if it gets to be about 85 decibel or above, it's too loud and it could start causing damage to your ears. So you wanna consider moving away from the noise or putting in earplugs or using earmuffs to protect your ears. Damage from noise exposure can be temporary or it can be permanent. With temporary hearing changes, or what we call a temporary threshold shift, things can sound muffled after a loud noise exposure, like using power tools or going to a loud concert. Or you can have some ringing that seems to recover within a few minutes to hours. Newer research has shown that maybe that what we thought was temporary was not so temporary after all. Hearing seems to return to normal, but actually some of the stereocilia inside the inner ear have been damaged and that damage adds up over time. So it may not be as temporary as we, we originally thought. Um, and then of course we can have permanent damage. Sometimes you're around a loud noise exposure, like a gunshot, you have muffled hearing after and it may not recover at all, or it only partially recovers. And that we would consider a permanent threshold shift. And then of course there's permanent because of an acoustic trauma, which is an extremely loud sound like a gas explosion or an impact noise like metal on metal collision. And these are usually very short bursts of extremely loud noise. Um, and, and those are more rare, but they certainly can happen and they cause true trauma to the ears. And you could even have bleeding from the ears. So how exactly does noise damage hearing? So this is a diagram of our auditory system and our ear canal is shown here with sound waves moving through it. The sound waves come to our eardrum and the vibrations of sound get passed through the ossicles or the bones of the middle ear. And then sound comes to the cochlea, which is the inner ear. And this cochlea is very important. And this is where the stereocilia or hair cells of the inner ear are housed. Those stereocilia pick up the sound and then they send it up the nerve to the brain. And the brain is really what's doing the hearing and the processing of the sound, but the ear is how we get it to the brain. And so these stereocilia are very, very important for detecting and, and ultimately processing sound. <clears throat> 
So how do structures get damaged in the inner ear from loud noise? Well, there's both a metabolic process that occurs and a structural process that, that can cause damage. So we have some rows of these V or U-shaped hair cells. There's three rows down here of what we call outer hair cells and one row of inner hair cells inside the cochlea. And with noise damage, we see that many die or they become misshapen over time. And this is because of a, a metabolic process from the overstimulation of the ears by high intensity noise. It can result in decreased blood flow to the cochlea, which then results in excess production of reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species are responsible for the aging process in many parts of our body, but in the ears as well. And they can start a process called apoptosis, which is a process of the cell dying. And then we can have structural changes just from the, the swelling and rupture of structures inside the cochlea from a high intensity noise. The cochlea is filled with fluid and the membranes can stretch and swell and sometimes rupture. And if fluid rushes out, the hair cell will be exposed to air and it will die. A lot of times, you, you, if you have an audiologist, you may have heard them use the uh, analogy with noise exposure and noise damage to blades of grass. And we often say noise-induced hearing loss is like footprints over grass. You walk over it a couple times, the blades of grass come right back. But if you stomp really hard or if you trample over it, if it becomes heavily trafficked, the grass will eventually die there. And noise exposure is very similar to that. What does noise-induced hearing loss look like in patients when they come into our clinic? Well, often they'll report symptoms of trouble hearing in background noise. <clears throat> they'll report a high-pitched tinnitus or ringing in their ears. They'll usually say that other people are mumbling or other people just don't speak clearly. They'll tell me they're turning the TV volume up louder than they used to, or they have trouble discriminating words that have similar consonant sounds like shell, fell, and sell. They may have a history of using firearms with or without hearing protection, or have worked in other loud noise environments like a loud factory, or they did had loud hobbies like motorcycle riding. As for the hearing test, we can often see what's called a noise notch on an audiogram when, after we do a hearing test. And just to orient you on how to read this graph, we look, we're looking at low pitch on the left, moving up to the right to high pitch sound. So bass to treble, kind of like keys on a piano. At the top is soft. And as we move down, we go to louder and louder volume. And so the range of normal hearing is anywhere above this blue line. Anything falling below the blue line, we consider hearing loss. And so in this example, this person has normal low frequency hearing with a dip to a moderate hearing loss in the high frequencies. And then we see a recovery of hearing as we move to higher and higher frequencies. And this is a very typical pattern of noise-induced hearing loss where the frequencies most affected are between three and 6,000 hertz, hence the name noise notch audiogram. You may be asking yourself, well, what about age-related hearing loss? I have age-related hearing loss and I have a lot of the same complaints or symptoms of someone with noise-induced hearing loss. And a lot of times it can be difficult to separate the two. Noise is experienced over our lifetime. And of course, there are factors related to aging that our ears go through as well. On a hearing test, however, we can usually see a difference between the two, or sometimes there's a combination and they're combined on top of each other. But with presbycusis or age-related hearing loss, we'll see this sloping pattern where the highest frequencies are most affected. 
So of course, when we think about preventing hearing loss, there's nothing we can do to prevent the aging process, but there are things that we can do to mitigate them. And to mitigate them, we think about, well, what are the contributing factors? There are environmental toxins that we could be exposed to, like industrial solvents. There are ototoxic medications, like some antibiotics or chemotherapies. Of course, chemotherapies are life-saving drugs, but as people take chemotherapies, it's recommended to have follow-up hearing tests and, and monitor for changes in hearing. And sometimes there are changes in hearing and that begins a conversation with the physicians about different types of chemotherapies, different dosages, et cetera. So damage from noise is sometimes considered a subset of age-related hearing loss and thinking about how we can avoid loud noise exposure as we age. Genetics certainly play a role in how fast or how slowly someone's hearing may or may not decline. And then things like your, the health of your heart, diabetes, and the health of your kidneys are very important for your ears. So of course we want to avoid loud noise exposure and wear hearing protection, quit smoking, and limit your alcohol intake. Taking care of your heart is so important for many reasons. Exercise and eat a good diet. Eat a low sugar diet to avoid diabetes. Get a baseline hearing test if you have any risk factors for hearing loss or if you're over the age of 55. And talk to your doctor about supplements that may protect your ears from noise damage and other recommendations. Now, we mentioned earlier that reactive oxygen species are one of the things responsible for damage from noise exposure. And when we think about reactive oxygen species, we think about, well, antioxidants fight those. So are there antioxidants that can protect against noise-induced hearing loss? And the short answer is, yeah, kind of. There are some that have been shown to have some protective properties. Now, I will preface this by saying that Dietary supplements are not FDA regulated, and you should always talk to your doctor about be before you begin any new supplement regimens. But I can share with you what some of the research has said about some common supplements that are out there. NAC is a, a supplement that is a form of an amino acid, cysteine, and it's found in a lot of high protein foods naturally. Ginseng, magnesium, alpha lipoic acid and CoQ10 are other supplements that research has shown some protective properties against noise-induced hearing loss or temporary threshold shifts after noise exposure, but the supplements have to be taken before the noise exposure happens. So there's not really a magic pill that can definitely protect your ears. Um, there's no way to protect or prevent aging, but there are things that we can do to, to help and to hopefully prevent even a little bit. There are a lot of other health conditions that are related to hearing loss and everything is just a piece of the puzzle. Audiologists are concerned about your ears, but your ears are not the only thing on your body. Everything is all connected. So taking care of your heart Watching out for diabetes or getting your diabetes under control, falls risk, Alzheimer's, dementia, cognitive decline, chronic kidney disease, and depression are things that are all related to hearing. And so while we care about your ears, we also care about your whole person. So these are things we're thinking about as well. So, so far we've talked about how to identify when noise may be too loud, how noise damages hearing, and how to identify that you may have a hearing loss, how to read an audiogram, how to prevent some forms of hearing loss, and we've briefly talked about other health conditions that are connected to hearing loss. So next I'll have Anne-Marie take over to talk about how we can maximize our hearing abilities. All right, Dr. Woodson, can you hear me okay? 
Wonderful. So like Dr. Whitson mentioned, she talked more about preserving what you do have. The next portion will be more focused on maximizing the hearing that is left. And so that is what we are going to talk about first with what hearing devices we have. So how do I maximize my hearing ability? Well, the critical first step here is making sure you're getting the most benefit you can out of your hearing devices. Are they programmed with real ear measures? Do they have a good physical fit on your ear so they don't fall out? Have you had your hearing tested and your hearing aids programmed recently? Are your hearing aids clean? A little bit of wax can block a whole lot of sound. And are you wearing them at least eight hours a day? A lot of research shows that the more you wear your hearing aids, the more your brain is able to make use of the sound. With that, we recommend that you wear your hearing aids as many hours as possible. You use both speech and visual cues and a couple other items that we'll go over in this talk. In this talk. I mentioned real ear measures on the other slide, and in case you're not familiar, this is the number one thing we recommend with hearing aid programming. It's basically a tiny microphone that goes in the ear canal, and it allows us to actually measure the output of the hearing aid to make sure we are giving you exactly the correct amount of sound for your specific hearing loss. And so as you can see in the, the red right on the left side of the screen, it's basically a guessing game without having real ear measures done. But in the green, we are able to measure and correctly prescribe the right amount of sound for each individual patient. And if you've purchased your hearing aids through our center, every single one of our patients goes through real ear measures. Uh, the carrots at the bottom are a reminder, if you have gone through this, you sat and listened to a passage about carrots quite a few times while we had all the programming done. Next, we're going to shift gears a little into auditory training. Now, often when you say auditory training, people think of a child learning to hear with someone like a speech therapist. And with kids, that might be the case. But with adults, there are different approaches. It's more of a rehabilitation process in attempt to restore the hearing that you once had. So what is auditory rehabilitation? It's the audiologist's main job. The process of identifying and diagnosing hearing loss, providing therapy to people who have hearing loss, and hearing aids or other resources to improve communication and quality of life. The goal of auditory rehabilitation is to reduce the impact or burden of hearing loss on someone's day to day. And auditory training is a part of that auditory rehabilitation process. Auditory training is a technique to enhance listening skills and improve your speech understanding. It's very purposeful and systematic, and it is taught in specific ways so that the listener can make perceptual distinctions about different sounds. Who could benefit from auditory training? A lot of people. Uh, anyone who's had a recent change in hearing, new hearing aid users, new cochlear implant users, or people who've had a change in their hearing and thus a change in their device programming, people who have had struggles improving their speech understanding in the past, and anyone who has hearing loss who's had a change in lifestyle that makes their listening needs more demanding, such as a new job. How is auditory training completed? It can be done a few ways. Uh, there are online programs, mobile apps, workbooks, informal and formal ways to go about it. LACE is an online computer program uh, developed by audiologists and engineers. And LACE 
claims that they they developed their program as a physical therapy and that they are helping you with your auditory system and building it to be stronger, just as you might have some sort of physical weakness that you devote time and energy to to make stronger. And their website is listed on the bottom if you would like more information. This is a screenshot of uh, their website. And as you can see on there, the cost is about $100 um, and it's accessible to anyone. So it is a widely available uh, program. However, we'll go a little bit more into how useful it can be. Is auditory training effective? Is it going to make a difference in the situations that you're struggling in? There are many studies that show improvement to speech recognition and understanding with formal auditory training programs, such as that online LACE program. And the big question we always have is, well, does this relate to the real world? One study uh, by the VA found improvement in fast speech and background noise processing for those that completed the LACE program, but the results didn't translate into the real world uh, improvement, meaning they were able to successfully improve at the sentences or topics in the program, but when they went to a noisy restaurant with their family, they didn't feel like they were hearing any better. A systematic review of 13 different studies found a small improvement from these formal auditory trainings. And so that's to say, maybe it'll help a little, maybe it won't relay into the real world. We're not finding a lot of strong evidence. Many studies use the reading aloud method of listening to the auditory input while reading the visual input at the same time as a placebo treatment in their trials. Often there's no significant difference between the placebo and the formal training. So you can spend $100 on lace or you can read aloud to yourself from a book and both will probably give you about the same improvement according to research. So is it effective? Well, like I said, there's some improvement, there's some questionability of how much it will help you in different environments. And overall, you might just wanna consider the more affordable options of reading a book to yourself uh, before you pay for something out of pocket. Informal auditory training, as I've started to touch on, is doing things like reading aloud to yourself, reading along with an audiobook, watching the TV with closed captions, and talking to yourself throughout the day. This allows your brain to hear all sorts of different speech sounds, but also have some context to help understand what they should be. And this helps the brain reprocess the sound now that it is different than it was before. We wouldn't be able to talk about auditory training if we didn't touch on lip reading. Lip reading is something a lot of our patients ask us about, and we will be talking about how much it can help you and your communication needs. Lip reading is the perception of speech by interpreting visually available movements of the face. We all lip read to some amount because our, our eyes naturally look to get that supplemental information and context. This is especially true in very noisy places. The difficulty with lip reading is that a lot of words can actually look the same from our lips. So if you consider chew, june, new, and two, and you can try those yourself, notice how your mouth is making a very similar movement for all four of the words. As I mentioned, English is especially difficult with lip reading. Only 30% of English speech information is available at the lip level. Tongue position, the height of the tongue, vibration of the vocal folds, all impact the sound that exits your mouth. And all of those things are invisible to uh, the average person communicating with you, which is why only 30% is visible. Lip reading research uh, is limited and outdated. Some people are simply better at it than others. 
performance varies widely. Young people tend to do better than older adults, and it can be influenced by working memory and auditory processing. The big takeaway here is there's not a great way to become a better lip reader, and lip reading cannot be the only source of information. It is a supplement, something that can provide extra information to help your brain fill in the gaps, which a lot of us were using before we covered our face with masks in the pandemic, but using it as the sole source of information will cause you to have a lot of flounders along the way. So how do I maximize my hearing ability if I can't improve my lip reading skills? Well, we would recommend communication strategies. These are different things to help bridge the gap with the damage from the hair cells to the hearing that you once had. And it might mean asking, uh, telling a person that you didn't hear them, rephrasing or getting repetition from someone, getting rid of distractions, multitasking, having someone look up at you instead of down at their phone when they're talking to you, uh, speaking to someone closely instead of across the room or around a corner, and saying a person's name or tapping them on the shoulder so their brain can cue into you before you start talking. The photo on the bottom right hand is also a reminder that our environment impacts how well we can hear. Big open spaces allow those sound waves to bounce all over the room and add more distortion to speech, making it more difficult to hear. So considering smaller spaces, more enclosed places, if you're having difficulty hearing. We talked about a lot today. Uh, Dr. Whitson spoke about noise and age-related hearing loss, different levels of noise and ways to measure it, ways to prevent hearing loss, such as taking care of your brain and your heart health, and protecting your ears from loud sounds. We talked about formal auditory training, such as that LACE program, and the limited evidence at this point in time, as well as informal auditory training, such as reading aloud or listening to an audiobook, which can help your brain retrain and reprocess sound. Improving cognitive ability, like working memory and attention, which can help with our processing of speech. The limits of lip reading, but also how it can be helpful to be added on on top of other communication strategies. And lastly, to keep your hearing aids clean, up to date, and properly programmed with real ear measures. Using those in combination with communica communication strategies is the best way to help you maximize your hearing ability. So how do we get to better hearing? Well, maximizing hearing and vision abilities is a start, using them to work together using communication strategies to fill in any gaps, protecting your ears from loud noise, and living a healthy lifestyle so that all the systems in our body are working better together. And at this point, that finishes our webinar and we will see you next month.